I love doing this podcast because I get to spend some time with some of these young up and coming coaches that are really hardcore studiers, students, passionate about what they do. And that's Kate Popovic Goss from Bradley. Kate, thanks for being with us on the podcast. Absolutely. It's always great to chat. You, uh, Unfortunately, you've known me since I was about 18. Um, and uh, I always think it was so funny on our first call. You're like, yeah, when you're at Pitt. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I barely remember when I was at Pitt at this point. <laughs> Listen, Kate, this is what I remember. First three steps, dig, 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 fill in the lane, putting somebody on the, on your back, posting up, seal, spin, then a screen, like take two people out. That's absolutely. what I'm thinking. Absolutely. Right? Unfortunately, that's what earned me a ruptured Achilles in year one as a head coach. So we're, um, we're, we're laying low. We're being intense with our words and maybe a couple of, you know, displays. I, I did get out there to jam some screens today and show them how, what we were up to. But uh, yeah. other than that, I'm, I'm happily on two feet on the sideline this season. So we're, uh, we're, we're healthy and we're, we're excited to be back in action. And you know what, this is, this is the other thing too. Like, you know, coaches come at the game from different perspectives, right? There's a lot of point guards coaching our game. There's not a lot of post players that see the game from the back row defensively. They have to communicate all action that mm -hmm. have to see things happening up the floor in different ways. How has that helped your uh, game develop on the sideline? Um, you know, I think it's really interesting. And I think um, it, I think what it helps me with is having a relationship with the point guard um, in an odd way because I know how vital it is to have a great point guard. Um, I was fortunate enough to play with a lot of them. And so I think that that's helped me, but I think in terms of defensively, that's what's anchored my mindset. I'm, I'm a defensive coach first. Um, coach McEwen, obviously one of my greatest mentors, I know you and I always somehow get back to Joe. Um, when I was really starting to, to get into coaching, he put me on the defense for that very reason. He's like, that embodies who you were as a player who you were in your style of play and, and, and how you think. And I think that that's why you need to really develop on this side of the ball. And um, obviously he coached me. So he knew where my brain went. And I think that that's, you know, how I've really started to build our identity. And I think that that's been probably the most fun for me this season is um, in year two of, of obviously a pretty big rebuild. You want to see what you're trying to build come to life. And I think that that's what our team is really starting to do is execute the vision of what, we're trying to build. We are obviously bringing in pieces that fit that, but we're going to be a defensive team first. I love to junk it up. I love to mix things up. And um, when your team takes on the excitability factor in that, which I think we're starting to do, they're really excited about, you know, different schemes and things like that. I think that's, what's been really fun. Although I do need to get my team to rebound the ball better. That's, that's one thing we got to get better at. And I got to get some more size eventually in these future recruiting classes. But um, yeah, I think that that's really how it's helped mold me. Kate, when I'm looking at scheme defensively, because the game has advanced so much, the players are so much better on the offensive side. So, you know, are you at a point yet where with your team and your rebuild process where you can, you know, on this side of the floor, we're going to ice in the middle, we're going to drop on this side of the floor, but pending personnel, we're going to switch or we're going to trap, you know, like you can, you, you can call up different ball screen coverages and you can execute them off a timeout or whatever, but can you do that on, the court in different spots yet? Because I know you like to do that. I love to do stuff like that. Not quite. I don't think we're there. I What I do like though, is that I'm, I am challenging my team to start to think the game more on the defensive side of the ball and they're starting to understand it. I think the most, the hardest thing about what we're doing is I've always done a matchup. Um, we're playing multiple defenses this year. We're playing man and we're playing our match. Um, so that requires a lot of thinking in and of itself. What's great is I have some more players now that are familiar with the matchup. So it doesn't take quite as much time to teach everything with it. And they're starting to pick it up. Um, I think what we're starting to do is more so scout specific plays, you know, maybe certain players and adjust our coverages based on that. I mm -hmm. would absolutely love to get to the point where we're keeping things to one side of the floor. We're able to do different ball screen coverages within the same set. I think that's going to take a little bit more time, but I've been really pleased from year one to year two that my team is able to execute different schematic things, even now just from scout to scout which last year was a big challenge for us. Um, so now, you know, we are going to be able to defend Murray State, who's our next opponent, a little bit differently than we did Illinois State. And um, within each of our individual defenses, change up some coverages. And I think that that is going to be really important for us because, as you know, it's it's hard to guard one-on-one. -on -one. Um, 
it, whether it's, and we have, you know, what we're running into, we have great post players. We're young and we're a little shallow in the post. We're undersized, but like it, it's hard. It's really, really hard to guard guards one-on-one to guard anyone one-on-one. So I think that team defensive concept. And like you said, being able to switch things up based on personnel is super important. So um, we're, we're, we're progressing. I'm pleased with where we're at right now. When I am in a game and I'm getting on a roll and I'm going under, over, edge, trap, ice jam, switch, drop, coverage, seven or eight different variations of a ball screen that you can guard, uh, that's when uh, I know our game is at a really high level because I'm seeking those things inside the game myself, looking yeah. for what the game plan is. Okay, yeah. so now um, I want to talk to you about this word rhythm because rhythm has been on my mind a lot around the game. You know, there's a certain cadence to which we play offensively. Everybody wants to play fast. And, you know, I always say the rhythm can be north and south really quick, or it can be east and west with your cadence. What about your defensive rhythm? Like, how can you change the rhythm of the game? And what does that mean to you when you're thinking, you know, I, I want to stretch the floor. I want to shrink the court. I want to do different things. How, how does that rhythm come into play for you? Yeah, I, I love that question. I think um, that's something I actually talk to our team a lot about is, it, you know, rhythm and pace and where are we in that journey? Right. So obviously as we're building, I would love to play more up tempo and score a little bit higher. Um, but right now we're not quite there yet in terms of our depth and our personnel and all those types of things, but we can be really disruptive within the rhythm of the game. And that's our goal is to, how do we disrupt the other team's rhythm as we're finding ours? Because right now we're not quite consistent enough yet offensively to only rely on that rhythm. Right. And especially in our league, you have some really high octane offenses and teams that have played together for five years that are old and, you know, they know each other's area codes and social security numbers and before, you know, anything happens. And, you know, we're not there yet. We're new. My older kids are new to me. Um, and so what we're trying to do is be disruptive to that rhythm. And I think that that's where our defenses have helped us keeping teams off kilter. You know, when you play multiple defenses, it forces people to think and analyze um, coaches and point guards alike. And, and so I like to be more disruptive, um, especially as we're developing our offensive identity. But what's been great for us is our offensive numbers are really increasing every game. And I think our kids are starting to develop a little bit of synergy. So um, that's been fun to see too. But yeah, I, I like to think more about how I can cause some chaos more than <laughs> make the yeah. game super smooth. And um I think when we were really good at Northwestern, we were always able to control pace. And I think that that's really important, whether we wanted to play more up-tempo because the team was more of a half-court team or vice versa. And that's eventually the goal for us to get to. Well, I, I love the word disruptor. You know, I, I think disruption inside a game is so critical at, at different times and you have to, you know, decide. It's kind of a feel, right? Some of it is a feel about when's the right time to change it up. Okay, yeah. I want to ask you about how much time you're spending in practice on situations you know um offensive and defensive situations we always look at atos from an offensive perspective but there is a the defensive side of it as well how are you guys doing on that yeah i think um that's something that we've been a little bit better at this year is because we're playing multiple defenses being able to change things up out of a timeout has been something fun within the course of a game um Coaching the other night, I realized we definitely have to work more on the defensive ATOs, um, especially end of game situations. I had a point guard, my freshman point guard in a big three started running back and we needed to foul. And she was excited. She had the ball. I'm like, get up, get up. I'm like screaming at her. And she's like, oh, wait, what? I can't just shoot. And I'm like, no. Um, but we actually, we spent a lot of time on our end of game plays, end of game situations, and we've executed really well down the stretch. I think, which has given our kids a lot of confidence, um, just in terms of our offensive situations. And I think defensively, um, you know, being able to get stops in crucial times is something that we execute a lot. I think we have to eventually get a press in, um, all those types of things. There's so much you want to do and so little time in the coaching world, but, um, we dedicate a lot of time to special situations. And especially as we get into league play, I think it becomes more and more vital as, you know, we talk every day. Um, one of the things I'm really pleased with right now is our margin of our margin of loss is only six points. And that shows us we are in games. Right. So how do we finish them? And, you know, I think what I'm trying to emphasize with my team is it's not just those last two minutes or end of games or ATOs. It's those possessions you can steal throughout the course of the game, whether it's you get one more rebound, whether it's you get one more loose ball, whether we change a scheme for one possession out of a timeout and get a steal, that's one possession in our favor. And that's what I'm trying to teach my team is, you know, we're in two possession games right now. 
how do we find a way to get four more possessions so that we can flip that tide? And that's um, where we're at with it, really. So I know you're a football fan, and I'm sure you watch some of the college football playoffs, but I want to ask you about an NFL game. Did you watch the end of the Detroit Lions game? I did. It okay. was nutty. <laughs> okay. So my question from a basketball perspective is because I learned almost as much about vernacular through listening to football analysts as I do from basketball analysts, right? Yeah. Because I know there's some people that probably turn the sound down on me and I turn it down on some of them. But for this particular situation, I want to ask you this. It has been said that Dan Campbell, the head coach for the Lions before the game, went over some situations in the game with the referees, right? And the very situation that he claims he went over happened and yeah. the refs messed it up. Yeah. Like how much of that pre-communication do you think is important? Like for you, if you want to tell an official, I'm, I'm going to call timeout or I'm not, or I'm going to foul, we're going to trap or steal first. Then we're going to foul. Please don't anticipate. Like what, what tell me, take me through your thought process with your staff and what you're thinking, like end of game situations with those last couple of plays. Yeah, you know, I think that was one area that Joe McEwen excelled in, in a sense of um, understanding, like even something as small as, hey, I'm going to put a sub in here so that you can get your defense set after a free throw. Like those small, small things that buy you three seconds, which seems so minuscule, are ever so vital. And I think that like the other day, one of the most important things I did was we were fouling and I looked at the refs and I'm like, hey, you have to review the clock. I didn't have a timeout. So, mm -hmm. you know, in those situations, having that candor and being able to just anticipate that bought me a timeout that I didn't have where I was able to get something on the board for my kids. Um, so I think that's great. Just, and I, and I think that's where I like our game, um, you know, having relationships with the refs and, and, and being able to, for them to kind of understand who you are too, I think is important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that I learned from Joe early. I watched, he worked the refs hard. Joe worked the refs real hard. Yeah. Um, but I well, think, that, yeah, but I think that that, um, it is a part of it, you know, and it's something that like I pay a lot of attention to. And I think too, knowing the rules, um, is, is important now. You know what I mean? Like I'm listening to so many broadcasters that forget that like charge circle doesn't matter anymore in women's basketball. They eliminated it and you don't need it anymore. Um, all those little intricacies. So I think that that is, is important. And I actually, I'll talk to the refs about some tendencies that maybe I caught on film of the other team. Um, and maybe put that bug in your fourth game. Yeah. No, I, I think it's I think it's a part of preparation, right? And and having that communication, like no one, it's a big topic in our game right now, right? Because of the um situation that I was in the other night with the NC State Virginia game, where an official back to back plays teed up two separate NC State players for going and one, and it wasn't egregious, not really directed towards anyone. It was just a celebratory something we do in the game it's kind of like you can't check me or you know whatever we say you know we say a lot of things the whole benches all across the country erupt with you know and one when things happen around the, the rim so it has made me really think a little bit deeper into no one wants to watch a coach rant and rave over on the sideline and get upset right the refs don't want it nobody wants it we would rather have communication so how how do we you're a young coach, just your second year. Like what would be best practices or suited to help you, it, you know, communicate with the officials better? Like I'm not talking about like a tea party, but I mean like something that allows them to understand your personality, your drive. Like I know you're going to be hyped up before the game. I know your personality. I've watched you. So yeah. I, I know what you're going to be like, but how do we work that balance? Yeah. I mean, I think the, like the communication piece, and I think like you hit it, you know, you and I were just kind of chopping it up before we hopped on here, just about, you have to be who you are. Um, I am who I am. And and I think like, even with the officials, I am who I am. And I, I think they, part of it too, what's nice is when you get familiarity within your own league with certain officials, they're going to know you and be able to have candor. Um, and I appreciate that. I think the one thing I learned early in my career about officiating is you just want refs that you can talk to. That's it. You know, if they're calling the game one way or another, whatever it is, rest that you can have a conversation with. And, um, you know, no one, including myself, wants to see 
a game be managed in that sense of like, we're taking the passion out of it. Um, and I don't think refs necessarily want to manage a game like that, but I think that that's where, you know, it, it all comes into play, but I, I think it is important. And I think that, um, the good thing about me is I think you pretty much know what you're going to get. And, um, it's, it's been good, but I, again, it comes down to possessions too. So if you can steal one possession, you can steal this and that it, it is, mm -hmm. it is tremendously helpful, but, um, you know, so far I've had really good experiences with the refs. And again, I think that's something I learned early in my career because I watched coach work the refs so hard. And I was like, man, but after the game, they're like, Joey, how are you, man? You good getting to Philly for the holidays. And I think just like anything, it's all about the relationships right. that you're able to foster. And if you're yourself, I think that usually shines through. You know what, Kate, that's what I love about this podcast is I don't write down one question. You and I have a conversation and it's so easy and seamless. And we just talk about the game and we could keep going, but we can't, we got to <laughs> keep it. You know, the Valley's got me on minute. No, they don't have me on minute restriction. I just want to make sure that we keep it light and fun and that people enjoy listening and get to know you and your program a little bit more and get to know a little bit more about how you go about operating your business and you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that you took the time. Thank you so much in the middle of the season for spending time with us on the podcast. Yeah, I think um, I appreciate it. And, and, and Debbie, you know, we we go way back. And like I said, it's always great to great to talk. And I know you're such an ambassador for the game and um, you've been around and, and representing us strongly for a while. But I, I know for me, I'm really excited about my team. Um, you know, it's it's been um, year one was really hard for me. I, I I'm not a new year, new me type of person with the new years rolling around, but I was excited to get into 2024. Um, but my team has been really fun to coach. And I think the one thing I've, I've kind of learned now, and I'm excited to continue to carry is, um, to remove some of the pressure and like the things that you tell your kids, you got to listen to yourself and, and they want me to be who I am in my leadership style. And, um, you know, I think that that's really starting to evolve. And I also, I really just enjoy my girls and I think they're fun to watch. So keep an eye on the Braves. Um, we're going to keep on scrapping and clawing and battling. And um, I'm just excited to to see how the Valley treats us. Although I'm not too excited to head on this road swing to Murray State and Belmont. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're playing really well, but welcome to the Valley, right? Right. Welcome to the Valley, Kate. Welcome to the Valley is right. It's a great coaches league full of really competitive games every night there's no circle w that's for sure and uh we wish you well we thank you so much again for joining us all right we will see you guys soon thanks so much